The Epic Casebook. In which Inspector Carr investigates. You might find it astonishing that the dramatization you're about to hear concerns my investigation into the accidental death of a 45-year-old Londoner named Mark Streetley. You'll be even more astonished when I tell you that this was not when I was still a young sergeant attached to Vine Street, but a senior member of the murder squad. What's more, when we finally caught up with the person responsible, he was tried for Streetley's murder and sentenced to several years' imprisonment, despite the fact that the man's death was not as the result of a premeditated act. This would appear contrary to established law and jurisprudence, yet such was the case. Let me tell you about it. I've called my story Within the Shadow of the Yard. I think perhaps my story should commence at the time when I had just emerged from a charming little cafe not more than a couple of hundred yards from the yard. It was about ten minutes to two on a pleasant spring afternoon. My mind filled with problems concerning internal administration when suddenly... Chance. You run right under me wheel. That's true, so I saw. Now, keep these people back, Constable. Use your walkie-talkie. Get an ambulance quickly and a doctor. Get back there. Get back. I've been well, driving this truck for 20 years. I've never had an accident. Where is it? Uh, were you the oh, one no. shouting, stop thief? I'm a police officer. He's got away with 30,000 pounds. Who got away? Uh, just a minute. Uh, hurry up with that ambulance, Constable. Right, sir. Control. Now, you say somebody got away with over 30,000 pounds? Yes, sir. I just come out of the Lombard Bank with a month's salaries, and I was tossed. Didn't have a chance to draw my gun. He ran in his I saw the whole thing, officer. I saw a man with a hat over his eyes, wearing dark glasses, run across the road with the traffic lights against him. And this poor gentleman lying there was running after him. That's Mr. Streetley, who kicks the tobacconist on the corner. Are you sending the ambulance right away, sir? Oh, you'd better take a statement from this security guard here. Uh, what's your name, by the way? Brown, sir. Dick Brown. Oh, look, 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 I'm very sorry, sorry, but you won't be able to move your truck until the traffic officer arrives. Oh, right. right, no, no, don't try and move him. Now, he's still breathing, but only just. Sergeant, take care of all this. Ah, here comes the ambulance now. I'm going back to the yard. It seemed that there was little I could do at the scene of the accident, and the statement of the pursuing security guard made it a matter for the robbery squad. The following day, I was sitting at my desk, pondering on the fact that a decent, law-abiding citizen should be struck down whilst attempting to impede the progress of the thief, when... Yes, Ops. Yesterday's victim of the accident corner of Petty Curry and James Avenue, sir. He just died in a Westminster hospital. AC instructed that you be informed, sir. Oh, poor devil. Has the AC seen all the relevant material? I assume so, sir. But since it was an accident, they're not likely to prosecute the truck driver. No, of course not. Why do you think the assistant commissioner instructed that the murder squad be informed? That man Streetley's death was the direct result of the robbery, and when death takes place during the execution of a crime, then it becomes murder, however unintentional. But, sir, this chap Streetly wasn't involved. He just heard somebody shout, stop the thief, and went chasing after the man, running against the lights. It would still have been murder had he been standing on the street corner. Enough of that, Ops. My compliments to Chief Inspector Lemming. We shall be taking over the investigation. No point in duplicating our activities, which means I've got to start at the beginning. Come in. Ah, you're Chief Inspector Carr. Uh, that's it. right, sir. Well, what's the point of employing security guards if this sort of thing happens? Mm. How is he, by the way? Oh, he has a very nasty bump at the back of his head. Complains of fierce headaches, but he's lucky not to have suffered a severe injury. How well do you know this fellow? Well, I know the guard. No, I keep well away from the financial side of the business. You'd better have a word with the chief cashier. Yes, sir. Uh, ask Mrs. Priestley to come up with him. Very good, sir. Yeah, she's been with us about two years, as far as I can remember. They always send the same chap. Do you think he's in on it? I wouldn't mind a few bumps for 30,000 pounds. Well, sir, we've delved into his background. There's always that possibility, of course. One of the reasons why I'm here. You sent for me, Mr. Simmons? Uh, yes. Look, this chap I interviewed a couple of years ago, you've been dealing with him ever since. Oh, you mean the robbery? Dick Brown? The security guard? Well, you don't think he... Uh, this is Chief Inspector Carr, Scotland oh. Yard. Here's one or two questions to ask. Now, um... Your brother manages their West End branch, doesn't he? Yes, sir, that's right. Oh, look, Inspector. National Security Limited, is, it's one of the biggest in the business. And Jimmy, my brother, 
He's very careful who he employs. Besides, Dick and Jimmy are in the army together. Oh, don't get me wrong, Mrs. Priestley. These are routine inquiries. At the moment, every single person connected with this organization and the bank will come under surveillance. I'm glad to hear it, Inspector. If we don't recover that 30,000 pounds, that's company's insurance... Now, forgive interest. me, Mr. Simmons. Normally, an officer from the robbery squad would be asking the questions. I'm anxious to capture the villain, not primarily to regain what was stolen, but to avenge the life of a decent human being whose wife is now a widow and whose children are now fatherless. <coughs> Sorry, that sounded rather pompous. Now, let's get on with it, shall we? I understand from Mr. Brown that he calls here on the last day of each month and you hand him a note to present to the bank. That's right. The bag containing the money was the property of this firm, I believe? Yes. An old-fashioned brown leather type, which fastens at the center. Yes, that's right. If you a bag I could photograph, one's identical. Mm, of course. If you come through to our department, they'll give you one. Yes, sir? I've sent over a brown leather bag... Looks almost like one of our murder bags. It's identical with the one the villain snatched after coshing the security guard. Now, I want it photographed and sent on general distribution. Yes, Could have been thrown away in a dustbin or a rubbish dump, or an eyewitness might have seen someone carrying such a bag. Very good, sir. Now, I want the background of James Clark investigated, brother of the woman in charge of the firm's cash, and, uh, well, it could just be a coincidence, manager of the security firm. Right away. Time's of the essence. Well, do, sir. Oh, by the way, sir... Next branch have been through concerning the guard of Richard Brown. Good. What have we got? Has a record, sir. Served six months for beating up a publican five years ago. Spent two years doing national service. Discharged honorably. Is known to frequent betting shops. That's interesting. Now, have the numbers of the larger denominations been circulated? Yes, sir. Well, the villain isn't likely to try and get rid of the money while it's still hot. According to the bank, there were over £700 in one-pound notes... That should keep him going for a week or two. Oh, uh, and find out as much as possible concerning the relationship between Mrs. Priestley and the guard. They could be working a conspiracy with or without her brother. Very good, sir. Thanks, Ops. Come in. You wish to see me, sir? Oh, yes, Constable. Come in, come in. Now, sit down, Constable. Now, first of all, I want to express my regret that I left the scene of the accident when I did. Perhaps if I'd stayed... Uh... Oh, well, no good crying over spilled milk, I suppose. But I heard the police whistle within seconds of my coming out of the Tudor Cafe. It was you who blew that whistle, was it none? Yes, sir. Whilst in the execution of yeah, my all duty... Right. I... Uh, cut the cackle. Now, where were you exactly when you blew that whistle? I'd just come out of Bride Street into St. James's Avenue when I heard someone in the distance shouting, Stop thief, stop thief. I immediately blew my whistle, knowing that Sergeant Nelson was on check duty in the vicinity. And then I saw someone dash across the lights, and there was someone on his heels. I didn't recognise him till that truck knocked him down. Poor oh, Mark Streetley. I'll get my fags from his shop. Oh, in your statement, you say that the villain had his head down and was clutching at his raincoat. Well, that's the impression I got, sir. But it all happened so fast. Oh, fair enough. He probably put the bag inside the raincoat as he ran. Now, um, take a look at this map. Now, these arrows point in the direction where the pursued and the pursuer were running. Now, there's nowhere for the villain to hide without being seen by somebody. So the chances are he jumped into a vehicle somewhere... In this circle. That's what I thought had happened, sir. How long have you been working with Y Division? Three years, sir. Ever since I joined the force. Look, sir, I'm sorry my statement makes so little sense, but... Well, now, it, that's it... all right, Russell. It all occurred within a few seconds. Nevertheless, the villain took an awful chance. Yes, Ops. Records have just come through, sir. Yep. James Clark. According to Louis the Lip, the Lewisham mother put the finger on him. Oh? For what reason? Laid an even 5,000 on the paper at Blue Velvet. Which got beaten by a short head. He must be a very desperate man. Could be that he decides to rob his friend and colleague rather than have his body found floating down the river. This is interesting. Very interesting indeed. I decided not to explore the possibility of Clark's involvement in the robbery, be it with or without the security guard's connivance, on the assumption that, should he be the culprit, I must allow time for him to repay his gambling debt. And so, for something like 24 hours, we worked on other aspects of the case. And then... Well, I'll be. What brings Chief Inspector Carr to this den of iniquity? Oh, cut out the nonsense, Lofty. I need to talk to you. Talk to me? A few years ago, when you was a sergeant at Vine It's Street... about Dick Brown of National Security. Oh, don't ask me. Don't tell me he's asked for police protection. A little swine. He shouldn't punt if he hasn't got the wherewithal to gamble. Let's go into your office. Ah, 
When did one of your boys last talk to Clark? Oh, speak up, man. I haven't got all day. Well, what is all this? But nothing's happened to him, has it? All right, I, I did send word that if I didn't get the money within seven days, I, I'd be angry. Very angry. If the law didn't let punters flee the gambling net, we wouldn't have to put a finger on them. But I don't understand it. Why are you here? Murder, Lofty Evans. Murder. He... he been murdered? I take it that Clark hasn't repaid his debt. Of course he hasn't. Right. He may be as innocent as the driven snow. Now, this is just exploring possibilities. But he's the manager of the security firm whose client was robbed of 30,000 pounds. I see. The Maybury job. Yeah. <laughs> and his sister's the chief cashier, he once told me. Now, let's not jump to conclusions. Now, here's Clark's telephone number. I want you personally to put some pressure on. Now. Hey, wait a minute. In front of you? Well, what I mean to say If is... he did the job, I'll soon know. Now, I haven't got all night. Do it. Sounds like his sister. Ask for Jimmy Clark. Hello? Um, I'd like to speak to Jimmy Clark, please. Well, he's just having dinner. It's urgent. Tell him it's Lofty Evans. Well, just a minute. Lofty Evans. Give me that. Look, I'm in the middle of dinner. You'll be lying in the middle of a coffin if I don't get my money. You heard what Spud told you. But I haven't got it. Jockey Bishop told me it was an absolute cast iron suddenly. And the race had been fixed. Yeah, more fool you for listening to such rubbish. I want a straight answer. Do I or do I not get a dough? Well, speak up. You have to do whatever you like. It's no go, Lofty. I haven't got a thing I can sell. All I can offer you is a hundred pounds a month out of my wages. Are you crazy? Hundred quid a month? Better take I'll 50... have to take what's coming to me. His sister. Are you there, Lofty? Yeah, I heard you the first time. What about your sister? She's got a good job. A widow with two small kids. Don't make me laugh. Ray, Look. ask Jimmy. Tell him we'll go to the police. Yeah, I heard that. You can tell your sister if she goes to the she police. She wasn't serious, Lofty. Really, she wasn't. Please don't do anything to her. Well, why should we put a finger on your sister? She didn't welsh on a bet. Good night. Did you hear all that, Governor? I did. Sounded very genuine. Oh, well, that's another upturned stone revealing very little. Come in. I only have half an hour for lunch, Inspector. Yes, I know. And it's very good of you to call, Mrs. Priestley. But then, you're only five minutes' walk from the yard. That's what's so maddening. The whole incident took place within a few hundred yards of the headquarters of the Criminal Investigation Department. And yet, we seem to be no nearer than when we first started the investigation. Dick tells me he's being followed. Jimmy thinks so, too. My brother, Jimmy Clark, who manages the security firm, he's Dick's boss. Were you surprised? The thief knew exactly where the security guard was going to collect Maybury's staff wages, knew the time, and what's more, had carefully planned his getaway car. You do realize that whether it was a conspiracy of one or three, the villains are wanted for murder. But that's not true. But Dick says he's surprised he wasn't killed. He could have easily identified the thief. He, he might have turned round... But he didn't. No. The villain did not intend to kill. Probably to render Mr. Brown unconscious, but he didn't strike hard enough for that... He just waited behind the pillar, struck him on the back of the head, grabbed the bag and ran. But you see, a spirited citizen heard the stop thief, went chasing after the villain and got himself killed as he crossed the road. His death becomes an act of murder, even though it wasn't planned. Listen to me, Inspector. My brother Jimmy's a fool. He gambles too much. I'm sure you found that out, but I've never known him do a dishonest thing in his life. It's the fact that Mr. Brown suffered a severe blow, but nothing serious, which worries me... It's as though the villain took great care not to hurt the security guard unduly. Why are you telling me all this? Not sure, really. Now, this money, it's always collected at the same time? Yes. We're only around the corner, as you know. Dick, M Mr. Brown, he, he comes to my office and I give him a requisition note saying exactly how much we want and in what denomination. Yes, so I understand. Uh, Mr. Simmons and the rest of the staff are not involved, I understand. No. Mr. Freeman and Miss Smith make up the wage list. Sometimes it's 25,000 odd pounds, sometimes it's less. This last month, there was quite a bit of overtime. I see. Oh, please, please believe me. We had nothing to do with it. We? Jimmy or Dick or myself. No, I don't think any of you did. Well, thank you very much for calling. <clears throat> uh, enjoy the rest of your lunch hour. Go with a peaceful mind. Yes, sir? 
Should Sergeant Jackson return and inquire for me, tell him that if he's discovered anything urgent, I'm round the corner at Maybury's. Oh, can I help you? Oh, you're Chief Inspector Carr. Do you want Mr. Simmons? Because he's never in lunchtime. Oh, dear. Thought us of me. There's only a few of us work through lunch. But then... oh, I've just had a thought. You're Mr. Simmons' secretary, aren't you? Yeah, that's right. I've been here three years. You know that a detective has to consider every possibility, however far-fetched, so I was wondering if you might help me get rid of a... Well, one or two stray ends. Oh, I'd love to if I can. Well, take a look at this. It's um, a rough map of this area. Now, there's Petty Curry. There's St. James's yes. Avenue. Now, here's where you are, and just round the corner from you is the back. Yes. Now, we're about 100 yards to the right facing the embankment. Okay, so far? Oh, this is quite exciting. Well, time is of the essence, so let's go on. Now, the villain was hiding behind that pillar just to the left of the bank entrance. Okay, so far? Okay. Now, he has a blunt instrument in his hand, but we find it astonishing that no one saw the villain walk up to the bank and go behind the pillar. But if he was somewhere on the premises, went from the delivery entrance, he only has to walk less than 30 yards. Oh, is that what you think happened? Well, it's just a theory, young lady. The guard is not knocked unconscious, and therefore the villain wasn't very expert at being one. Mr. Brown shouts, stop, thief. The villain runs along the avenue, over the traffic lights, into the St. James's Underground, behind which is the parking lot of the area. Oh, uh, how many of the staff use it? Well, only the directors and Mr. Simmons. They charge £120 pounds a month. Profiteers. Well, Mr. Simmons couldn't help me. He didn't return immediately after lunch. No, he didn't come back that afternoon. Not the day of the robbery. And I didn't hear of Streetley's death until the following morning. Otherwise, oh, yeah, here is Mr. Simmons. Yeah. Hello, Chief Inspector Carr. Come see me. I'm rather rushed. Have to take end of month sales figures to our chairman. Well, this shouldn't take long, Mr. Simmons. Um, maybe go through to your office. Look, if I'm not in the boardroom by 2.15, I'm for the high jump. Well, it's only 10 to. Uh, should we go through? Uh, all right, after you. Although I can't tell you any more than I did the last time you were here. Uh, take a seat. Ah, thank you. Now, uh, Mr. Simmons, the more I look at this case, the greater it seems to be that the conviction that the robbery was an inside job. What, you mean either the guard or one of the bank employees was in cahoots with our chief cashier? Oh, I don't for a moment believe that any of the bank employees could have walked out of the bank and hidden behind the pillar waiting for the security guard to emerge with the money. The whole idea is preposterous. But how would he explain his absence? And what's more... There was always the danger of being recognized. When? Uh, it's my belief that someone from this organization waited until Brown departed for the bank, followed him, and later hid behind the pillar, coshed him, and ran off for the money, thereby causing that unfortunate Mr. Streetley's death. Now, all this occurred at ten minutes to two the day before yesterday. I take it that a large proportion of your staff were at lunch? Well, yes. So we can forget personnel, other than those engaged in the administrative side of your business. I shall require an alibi from each and every one of them. Well, you know your job best. I shall arrange... Our time's at the essence, so let's start with you. Where were you at ten minutes to two on the 31st? Well, lunch, of course. Where? Well, I went into one of those sandwich bars, as they call them. Had a quick snack and a coffee. So I never eat lunch. Was that at ten to two? Oh, now, really, Inspector, I don't know whether it was ten to two or twenty past one or... Dash it all, man. You, you, you don't, don't want think me I... to find the swine responsible, don't you? Yes, of course. Then kindly answer my questions. You left here at one o'clock, I take it. In fact, I know you did. Yes. I also know that you returned during the lunch hour. I... Yes, that's right. I, I'd left some papers behind. Knowing that everyone, including the young lady in the outer office, would be out shopping, being the last day of the month. But strangely enough, no one saw you leave again. You were out the whole of that afternoon, weren't you? But why don't you answer? Where'd you go? I told Mr. Maybury. I, I wasn't feeling very well. I took the afternoon off. Oh, no, you didn't. You had a rather busy early afternoon, coshing the guard, grabbing the bag, running into St. James's Park Station, out through the rear entrance where your car was parked, and away. What you do with the bag? You, you, you can't prove any of it. Uh, you're coming with me. We'll see whether I can make the charge stick or not. Yes, Ops. They found the bag and the looter. It was hidden under the floorboards of what his wife calls the storeroom. Well, that's it then. Thanks, Ops. Although when I first spoke to Simmons... I thought he'd be the last sort of person to cosh a security guard in broad daylight. Well, sir, if that man Streetly hadn't been knocked down by that truck, he'd probably get away with a sentence of seven to ten years. True enough. And what's more, if he hadn't talked so much, I might never have suspected him. You see, if you remember, when I asked him... How oh, well do you know this fellow? <laughs> the guard? Well, I keep well away from the financial side of the business. You better have a word with the chief cashier. Fair enough. 
But he went on to say... Well, you, you think he's in honest? Oh, well, I wouldn't mind a few bumps for 30,000 pounds. So far, so good. But later, when I questioned the chief cashier... Well, Mr. Freeman and Miss Smith make up the wage list. Sometimes it's 25,000, sometimes less. But this last month, there was quite a lot of overtime. That's what brought it up to 30,000. Now, how would Simmons know that? Since, by his own admission, it was outside his province. Once he was confronted with the loot discovered in his house, he made a full confession. How he had gambled heavily on the stock exchange, with the result that the building society had threatened to foreclose the bond on his house. How, in picking up the phone one day, the lines got crossed and he heard... So, you see, Mr. Scarsdale, our security guard will be arriving to withdraw over £30,000 in cash. Will you be able to cope? Or shall I leave the withdrawal until this afternoon? It was overhearing Mrs. Priestley that decided this financially desperate man to indulge in such an amateurish and equally desperate crime. The judge accepted the diminished responsibility plea and he was sentenced to 12 years imprisonment. Although, as I said in the beginning, the conviction was for murder as well as robbery. The Epic Casebook was produced by Michael Silver with Hugh Russ as Inspector Carr. Listen again next Thursday night at 9.30 to another exciting story from our Epic Casebook.